Well, hello everyone and welcome again to Kane Nation Universal so Conversation with myself, Anne Walsh. Today's conversation will be reviewing why, why are some of us pessimistic, why the others very optimistic. We'll be reviewing our mental health and what can we do to improve and better our mental health. My guest today, Professor Elaine Fox, all the way from Adelaide, Australia, will be giving us her own view on this topic. Before we get started, let me tell you a little bit about who she is. Professor Elaine Foss is a professor and head of the School of Psychology at the University of Adelaide, Australia. Prior to moving to Australia, she spent almost 10 years at the University of Oxford, where she was founded and directed, where she founded and directed a world-class research center, exploring the nature of resilience and mental well-being. She's a psychological trainer. She's a leading in mental health research, combining genetic psychology and neuroscience in her work. She also runs a consultancy in Oxford. Elaine performs bringing the cutting edge science and psychology to those top level of the sports, business and military. What's fascinating is that we'll be talking to her about her new book, Switch Craft. What does it mean to switch craft? In all the negative, how can we switch our mindsets? We'll also be going to her former book, which she's written ages ago. This was written in 2019. We'll be talking to her, what does it mean and how can we find positivity in the world today? I'm super excited to have our guests join us to talk to us about how we could find joy in the midst of sadness, how we could change our mindset, and how we could be positive again. Meet my amazing and wonderful guest all the way from Australia, Professor Elaine Fox. Well, hello everyone and welcome again to Payne Universal Conversation with myself and Welsh. As I said in my introduction, today's conversation is really one for you. Are you struggling with a mental breakdown? Are you a pessimistic, optimistic person? Which one are you? struggling to find your identity, struggling to find your joy. You wake up in the morning and not quite sure what, the day, what to make, make of the day. Should you be happy? Should you be sad? Well, my guest today, all the way from Australia, Professor Elaine Fox will be telling you about what it really means. What does, you, what, what does your mind questioning really mean? I'm really excited to have her here with us. Professor, how are you? Hi, Anne. Lovely to be on, and thanks very much for having me. I'm truly honoured to be here with you because, I mean, when you look at the world today, you look at the social media, you look at the media, you look at everything, there's just something out there that's causing our mental breakdown. And more importantly, I think the reason we're having this conversation is because people have a dis- definition of mental breakdown. I see it now used all the time. And I'm not, sometimes I think we're getting that point where I'm not even quite sure what is mental health anymore because we've got to that stage, people are constantly using it. My mental health, my mental health. Um, <laughs> talk about diabetes, people exactly know what diabetes is. When you talk about something like sickle cell anemia, we all know what sickle cell, we know what to benchmark sickle cell on. But when you talk about mental health, I'm not quite sure there's quite a benchmark towards what really, are you really at that mental health? Or are you just tired? You need a rest, you need to better your improve your life, you need to improve your circumstances. All of this we'll be talking to you about. But before we get started, who are you? <laughs> well, thanks, Anne. Well, I'm, uh, my name is Elaine Fox, and I'm a psychologist, as you said. Um, I'm originally from Dublin in Ireland, so um, I grew up in Ireland and did all my study there, and then worked for quite a long time in the UK um, at the University of Essex for quite a long time, and then at the University of Oxford for about 12 years. So I was there for quite a long time um, and just moved very recently to the University of Adelaide, where I'm head of the School of Psychology now in Adelaide in, in Australia. So I just moved in um, February this year. So it's still all quite new to me over here. So um, yeah, that's me. <laughs> wow. um, when you look at your background, because what you're doing is actually quite in a niche area. It's not something we used to talk about a lot. Psychology is not something we were quite proud to talk about. What led you on this path when you look at your background? 
It's kind of really interesting because um, when when I'm giving away my age now, but when I was studying in school in, in Ireland, in Dublin, obviously, psychology wasn't a school subject. So we, you know, I had no idea what psychology was. Um, but they had a very good system in Ireland in those days when, when you were offered a place in university. So I got an offer for um, a place in general arts or general sciences. So I could do a general science degree or a general arts degree. And the, the deal was that for the first three weeks um, in university, you could attend any lecture you wanted to and you didn't have to decide on your topic until um you know three weeks um so actually i went to university fully intending to study biology or geography they were the two things i loved in school i really liked those subjects and um, that, that's what i intended and of course i went to those lectures but i also managed to drop in on a couple of the psychology lectures and as i said i, I knew nothing about what psychology was because it wasn't a, a school subject in those days and the very first lecture was all about visual illusions and kind of illusions and why our eye doesn't show us, you know, a, a, a kind of a true version of, of the world around us. And, and the second one was all about the brain and biology and neurochemistry. Um, and I just got totally captured, to be honest. And, you know, I thought, well, actually, this sounds really interesting. So I thought, um, knowing nothing about it, I suddenly thought, OK, I'll give psychology a go. It seems interesting. And basically, here I am many, many years later. So I just I kept going. I did a degree, did a, a PhD in Dublin, worked in psychology, and I've worked in, in psychology all my life, really, in, in research, um, primarily, and teaching, obviously. The fascinating thing about you is that you were at University of, of Oxford and you spent almost 10 years of your life there where you funded and directed a world leading research centre exploring the nature of resilience and mental well-being. That's so fascinating. Yeah. Tell me a little bit about this project. It, it really is. And I, I was very, very lucky in, I think it was in 2012, I was awarded a European Research Council and um, what's called an Advanced Infest Investigator Award, which are brilliant um, awards. So the European um, Research Council is a big funding body that funds people within the EU. Very sadly now, because of Brexit, there's real problems for UK people holding these kind of grants now. But they're they're really really good grants because they um, they give you a very large amount of funding. They pay you a salary. They also pay enough to employ about four or five people, so you can set up a proper research team. Um, so I was very lucky that I applied for that. It's obviously highly competitive, but I was lucky enough to to get that, and um, which allowed me to set up a team in Oxford, um, where we did a whole range of projects around resilience and well. Being, but the main the main study actually, which we were very excited about, and we're still I still got lots of data which I'm writing up at the moment. And um, we followed a about 510 teenagers, so they were about age 12 when we started, and we followed them until they were about 17, so over a five year period more or less. So basically through the secondary school years, um, so teenage years, um, and we measured a whole range of things. We we um, we tested people at baseline, so obviously when they were around 12 years of age, and then roughly every 18 months later. So we had three testing sessions with, with everybody in the study, and we took a DNA sample. So we had a geneticist on the team, and um, so we had full DNA profiling. So we, we measured all the genes that exist. So we can look at the different genes. We measured all sorts of questionnaires, as you can imagine. We sat down and did quite detailed interviews with each of the children um, to really find out what's going on in their life, what's going on in their background. Um, and most importantly, we also measured what psychologists call cognitive biases. So it, the way we might look at things very negatively. So we, we can have very negative ways of attending to things, like noticing things. We can selectively remember more negative material. So that's why it was called the Cog Bias Project. So that was the kind of the, the short name for it. So, um, but it was a really exciting project, quite a large scale project, obviously, but you know, over 500 people. And um, the team did really well. I had a great team of people working with me on it. And one of the big problems with those kind of studies is you tend to get a lot of dropouts. So by the end of the five years, you might only have a, a fraction of the people you started with. But we did really well, actually, because um, by the end and the final test 
working session almost five years later, we still had, I think it was 480 four people were still um we were still testing and we had measures from them from all the periods so actually the team did really well i think and we we selected 10 different schools around the oxfordshire area london oxfordshire kind of area um and um yeah it was a challenging study but great study and as i said we still have a wealth of data we have published quite a few um, studies from that project but as you can imagine there's still lots of things to to write up and to analyze and <laughs> I, 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 I think this also led to your book because when you read your book one of the things that fascinated me about your book was the rainy brain and sunny brain <laughs> Because you talked about it and you gave a little a little bit of intro. Why is it some yeah. people are so pessimistic, so everything? They just they only see great things. Why are some people on the other side they can't see anything positive? Everything is um, a negative to them. I really want you to touch on this book because this is such a, a very picky subject. And I, I notice people who are on the other side tend to go have this anxiety, everything get, gets yeah. them and they have this mood swing. Can you just tell me a little bit about these findings and what this book is about? Sure, yeah, thanks, Anne. And I really enjoyed writing Rainy Brain, Sunny Brain. It's been out for a little while now. And as you say, it's really about the research looking at you know, why some of us are very optimistic. And we all know people who always seem to see the silver lining in, in whatever situation they're in, whereas others are just, you know, really, really pessimistic. And it's very difficult to get them out of that pessimism. Um, so to answer the question as to why we differ so much from each other in, in those ways, and we really do, I mean, lots of research shows that. I think there's, if you like, there's a, there's a larger kind of answer and a smaller answer. So if, if I look at the larger answer first, so obviously the larger answer is it's partly to do with our genetic makeup. So there's no doubt that our genes do make a difference. And you know, a lot of the research I've done, for example, is, has, has looked at that. The way we're raised, the way we're brought up is also really important, of course, and so our, our background, our environment, the school environment, our family, all of that obviously makes a difference. But actually, most importantly, is how the genes and the environments work together. And, and that's what people often don't realize. You know, we often talk about genes and environments and how they interact. And, and people often think, oh, the genes contribute a certain amount and the environment contributes a certain amount. But it's actually much more dynamic than that. It's much more fluid than that. So the genes actually work with the environments to, to a large extent. So just to give you an example, there was a very famous study done um, many years ago now, I think it was published in 2002. And um, it was actually a group of people who were in King's College in London at the time. So Terry Moffat and Afshalom Caspi, two wonderful researchers who did this amazing study where they followed people for 23 years. I mean, I found my five year study is challenging enough, but you can imagine following people for 23 years. So they started testing um, toddlers. I think they were about two or three years of age. And they followed them and tested them every year until they were about 26 years of age. So you can imagine this really, really long term study. Yeah. Um, and what they were primarily interested in looking at was there's a particular gene called the serotonin transporter gene. And we don't need to worry about the actual gene, but but there's a, there's a long and a short variant. And the idea was that people with a shorter variant of this gene would be more prone to depression and people with a longer variant wouldn't be prone to depression. So that's what they wanted to look at in this long-term study and after 23 years when they looked at the data they found absolutely no difference between the two genetic variants which you can imagine after 23 years would be very disappointing but actually the story changed dramatically when they looked at the environments that people were brought up in and that's where they found this real interaction between the genes and the environment so for people who are the short version of the gene, so that was the one remember that's considered the risky risky gene, those who are this riskier version if they were in a very adverse environment, like an adverse family background, where there are quite serious things going on, like maybe child abuse, alcoholism among the parents, like quite serious big issues. If that was the case, those people were four times more likely to develop depression. Whereas people with the long version of the gene in exactly the same environments had no raised risk at all of depression. So you can see how it, it wasn't just the genes alone or the environment alone, it was actually the way the two came together. If you had the short version of the gene and you happen to be in a very adverse environment, then your risk of depression really increased. But if you had that risky version and you were in a very supportive environment, there was, you had no increased risk of depression. And it's really interesting. So what that really shows us is that the genes are important, but what people often forget is that it also show, shows us that the environment alone isn't enough. It really is a matter of the two 
together. So, um, so that's kind of uh, that's kind of a long answer for the the big answer. As I said, the big answer is genes, environments. You know, that's what makes a difference. The smaller kind of answer, um, and the one that's probably more important in many ways, is our negative biases. Uh, as we've we've talked about um, earlier, so how we actually process the world around us makes a huge difference to how our life pans out. And um, as I say in, in the book, in Rainy Brain, Sunny Brain, you know, there's, there's nothing we can do about our genes. But given the genes we have, and that's it, there's not much we can do about our environment. You know, as adults, we we can do a little bit about it. We can try and make sure we're in a more supportive environment. But of course, things happen. We can't we can't control that completely. But the thing we really can control is is our biases, the way we process information. Um, so my biases, what I mean is, uh, so people, we know that um, we can measure um, what people notice in the world. So, you know, if you're flicking through a newspaper or something, if, for example, let's imagine you support Manchester United, you know, so they, they play in a red color, for example. So if somebody is, is looking through a newspaper and they notice red or they notice Manchester, they'll instantly zone in on that if they're very interested in, in that team. So, so we're very biased in our attention. And that goes for negative information as well. So in, in my early research, I did a lot of work with anxious people. And we find with anxious people that they have very strong biases to notice more negative information than positive information. So even though we're all exposed to the same kind of things around us, let's imagine on social media or listening to the news or whatever it is, anxious people will literally tune in much more to the more negative information um, and they won't really process the positive information as much. Um, whereas less anxious people don't show that kind of bias. And then we also get a bias in what we call interpretation. So if you imagine the social world is full of ambiguity, as you can imagine, you know, people make comments and we think, what did she mean by that? What did she mean by this? You know, it's very easy to take it up the wrong way. And, um, you know, again, we've done a lot of research on that. And what we find is that anxious people will absolutely, and people with depression, will absolutely interpret any kind of social ambiguity in a negative way. They will, they will never interpret it in, in a more benign or a positive way. And likewise with memory biases, when we're thinking about our past, um, people again who are particularly prone to depression are, have very strong negative memory biases. So they selectively remember the bad stuff that happened to them, and they tend to literally selectively forget the, the better stuff that happened. Whereas for people who aren't so depressed, they tend to either have the opposite or just have no bias at all, really. Sometimes they'll just equally remember the bad and the good. So I think those biases really do make a difference because as I said, you know, if you think, you know, people are in more or less the same kind of environments, but it's how you process that information, what you notice, what you're remembering, that's actually, that's what's in your consciousness. And that's really what makes a difference. So those biases are really, really important. And of course, they are something we can do something about, you know, we, we can, we can kind of work on controlling our biases in some way. So there is a way forward through this. That's what, that's the next thing is literally, as someone who's on that bias side, someone who sees everything in a different kind of way, what can we really do to help them? Because then normally that tends to lead to other kinds of illnesses. <clears throat> because when you start processing negative all the time, that tends to lead to depression, anxiety, being a exactly. human as well. So what can we really do to help people like that? Absolutely. There's, well, there's lots of things. Um, and I think the, the thing to do is to try and reframe things as much as you can. So we've, we've, all, we've all heard about um, reframing and some of the talking therapies we hear about is about that. It's about trying to you know, look at a situation and try and think of different interpretations of that situation. So one thing I often suggest to people is, you know, think back to something that really upset you. Maybe something, I don't know, a friend didn't call you back or someone let you down or something that really upset you. And try and, and think of some another interpretation. So whatever interpretation you've made is probably going to be pretty negative. For most of us, it is kind of negative. Said, oh, she doesn't care. She, you know, she didn't bother. Um, but actually, you know, there might be more positive interpretation. Maybe your friend has got her own problems, you know, and there's issues going on. Maybe she was busy at work and genuinely forgot. You know, there may be lots of much more benign interpretations that aren't so negative. So it's, it's, that's often a good exercise to do, just to think back of something that really upset you and try and kind of understand how you've interpreted that situation and then try and come up with another interpretation and then maybe another one. Maybe so for any situation, try and come up with two or three or four different ways of interpreting that. And then over time, what you realize is that actually there are other ways of interpreting it. 
And as I said earlier, the um, people with anxiety tend to instantly make a very negative interpretation. And then they kind of assume that that's the truth, that that is actually reality. So I think understanding that the thoughts in our head and the way we, we, the way we kind of understand a lot of stuff isn't necessarily the truth. You know, that's actually how we've interpreted it. But actually, somebody else may be interpreting that situation in a very different way. So, so that's one way of trying to get at those kind of biases. Another thing, a very simple thing I often say to people and, um, you know, is, is simply just try and look for the positive in life, which is, sounds a bit trivial at times, but I think you, if you're sitting on the tube state, train, for example, try and look out for the positive faces, like who's smiling or are the people laughing and joking? Because again, particularly if you if you are prone to, um, to worry a lot and to depression and anxiety, you tend to be drawn to the more negative. So try and just, you know, disrupt that in a way and, and just focus a bit more on, on, the, on, the, on the positive. And although one of the things I do want to say is, in rainy brain, sunny brain, one of the things I really wanted to argue is that, um, you know, optimism is far, and pessimism is far more than our thoughts. So we often think about, or oh, it's all to do with positive thinking or negative thinking, but actually it does actually go much deeper than that. So um, there's actually a number of different components to optimism. So positive thinking is definitely one of them, but positive actions, so the things we actually do is really important. And that may not be related to our our, our thoughts or not. And also just the um, our persistence is, is really important. So again, if, if I have time, I can just tell you a little experiment that we, we all, I used to do this in my lab class in Oxford, for example, um, quite a lot. So it's a very simple um, study where you give people, um, you know, these anagram tasks you can do. So it's just a jumbled up, say maybe five or six letters of jumbled up letters, and you have to come up with an English word as quick as you can. You know, so it's generally a fairly straightforward task. And um, so what we do is we, first of all, measure people's optimism and pessimism on a questionnaire measure. So we know the optimists, we know the pessimists. And then we give them this simple anagram task where they have, you know, these um, six letters and they have to come up with English words as quickly as they can. And we give them one after the other and they're going through it. Now you can imagine in Oxford especially, people are very competitive, so they really get into this. And of course, by about the ninth or the tenth um, word, um, we actually give them an impossible anagram. So there's actually the six letters that there's no English word possible. So it's, it literally is an impossible anagram. And the measure is simply how long does it take people before they give up? And what you find over and over again, I, I'm always amazed at, oh, I don't think it's, it's, I don't think it's ever failed actually. <laughs> you know, I think in the hundreds probably of experiments I've done with this, um, the optimist will always take about a minute and a half longer before they give up than the pessimists. It's just a really clear difference. So they'll keep going, they'll persist. Um, and that's a really important finding because what that shows us, and lots of other research shows us, that optimists tend to be much more persistent at things. Now, that's actually nothing to do with positive thinking. It's actually just a sheer difference in, in persistence. And that's probably why, for example, we know that there's a lot of evidence that optimists do better in business, in entrepreneurship, for example, um, because they simply will try and find a way around problems. They'll get up and go. They'll have a bit more persistent. And even though that's related in a way to positive thinking, it, it's actually different. So, so a lot of the kind of argument I made in Rainy Brain, Sunny Brain was we should get away from the idea that we can solve all our problems by just positive thinking. It's, it's actually much deeper than that. It's things like persistence, things like positive actions. You know, I mean, if, if you have the horrible situation where you find a lump on your body somewhere, for example, you know, no amount of positive thinking is necessarily going to, to make that go away if it is something serious. Whereas positive action, like going to the doctor, getting it checked out, that positive action is what will actually make a difference. So I think that's a little bit of a detour, but you know, I think it's important to point that out. And that's one of the reasons I really wrote um, that first book to, uh, to try and illustrate that, that it's not just about positive thinking. No, I really love that. I love this about positive thinking because every, that, everywhere you go, you see a lot of people say positive thinking, but what does that really mean? And it's not just for positive thinking. It's also, exactly. We should probably change it to positive actions. Take deep, absolutely, positive, but also do positive action, take things, take initiative, do something about it. Just don't say, just don't absolutely do it, do it. Do it. So, that, I really think that slogan is something we need to apply more and more. Positive thinking equals absolutely. So, um, absolutely, in terms of our wellness, when people find themselves in that state of, oh, I'm not feeling great, I feel down now, 
what, what are steps that people can take to really increase and make them feel much better, to help them, so we can really reduce the impact of anxiety <clears throat> in society today? What are the, what steps yeah. have you seen that help? I know we said positive action, but what would you give some, some clear examples that would work? Yeah, exactly. I mean, there's lots of things. And, and actually, in um, I've just written a new book called Switchcraft, yes, which, which is really about how we deal with them. Um, which mm. how we do, yeah how we deal with uncertainty and uh, and one of the big problems of course in in life is none of us like uncertainty we all like uh, you know to, to try and have a predictable world as much as we can um, but one of the things I argue in Switchcraft is of course that the world is uncertain and it always has been so even before the pandemic before any of that life has always been uncertain um, so the better we can deal with uncertainty um, the, the better our life will be basically and I think that's kind of really what Switchcraft is about it's, it's about learning to accept and embrace uncertainty and so that's one of the, the straightforward tips simply acceptance I suppose so when something really bad happens um, just accepting that okay it's not a nice situation you know um, and you shouldn't trivialize it in any way but actually all of us um, have bad things happen to us you know things do happen in in, in any life um, and so kind of accepting it and looking to see what's what's the best thing I can do about this situation is the key really um, and one a really interesting kind of straightforward thing you can do is um, what a lot of therapists use and when people are dealing with trauma is what we tend to do when we're dealing with a crisis or dealing with a trauma we tend to get into this kind of why question so we ask like why did this happen to me why did i get ill why did my friend die or whatever whatever it is um, so changing your why question to a how question can be very powerful. So rather than saying like, why did this happen? Say like, how can I get myself out of this? How can I improve my situation? You know, what can I now do to try and make things better? So simply shifting the question kind of shifts your entire focus really into a more positive way of saying, okay, you know, and it's giving yourself some control. Because I think one of the real problems, particularly in a crisis situation, is we feel out of control. We feel we, we don't have anything to control. So, so giving ourselves as much control as possible is really, really important. And kind of on that, I think that the very first thing is, I suppose, is to really think, um, you know, have a look at the situation, whatever the situation is, um, and try and figure out what can I control and what can I not control? Because in any situation, the things you can't really control. And a lot of us, you know, bang our head against a brick wall and we're trying to change things that we can't actually change. So I think just simply sitting back, it's, it's often, again, technically called decentering, you know, which you, you probably know about. So it's um, almost like stepping outside the situation and trying to look at it very objectively and can decenter yourself, if you like. And look at your situation and try and think okay what are the things i can really control what what things can i do to make things better what things can i not control and those things you, you really don't need to worry about in a sense you know because they're they'll just happen and you, you can't actually personally do anything about them but if there are things you can do something about that's really what you should should kind of focus on so i think that kind of thing i think acceptance that uncertainty does happen you know shit happens if i could use that <laughs> they might bleep that out but um you know i mean stuff does happen to all of us um and i think the other thing and and what i write a lot about in, in switchcraft because i've done quite a bit of executive coaching with different people and with sports people and different people and, you know, one of the things you find with sports people is they're very aware that no matter how fit you are, and you, I, I deal with some people now in British rowing, for example, who are super fit, you probably won't find fitter people, but each of their training sessions is still really, really hard and feels really awful and they, they, they fall off the, the rowing machine at the end of it. Um, and, but I think in life it's the same thing. So people often think that, oh, people who are resilient, people who are doing well, kind of sail through and, and it's all very easy and it doesn't feel difficult actually just accepting things do feel really difficult and even when you're coping really well that doesn't mean it's easy it's still going to be really difficult so I think that just that general kind of acceptance that actually sometimes life is really difficult sometimes really difficult things happen it's going to feel bad and again in switchcraft I talk a lot about embracing our negative emotions because often we try and avoid things like anger and fear and sadness um 
because they don't feel very pleasant a lot of the time, but actually they are telling us something important. They're, they're kind of nature's way of giving us important information about what's going wrong and what's, you know, so actually really tuning into those negative emotions and embracing them is, is kind of really important. Um, and also then trying to nurture your positive emotions as, as much as possible. Um, and again, often people don't do that, but trying to just nurture curiosity and gratitude and joy and happiness and all of those kind of positive emotions. Um, there was another, there was a very nice study done um, after 9-11 in the US. So after the World Trade Center um, terrorist attack, you remember, um, whereas as you can imagine, a lot of people, particularly people who lived close to the World Trade Center were extremely stressed after, after that. Um, and a couple of researchers based in New York did some research um, around that to see how people responded. And what they found was that people who actually managed to, in the middle of all the anxiety and sadness and anger, in the middle of all of that, those people who managed to get some positive experiences were the ones who actually did much, much better and were much more resilient. And there's one tragic story, but also a very kind of nice story in a way of one um, young mother who had a one year old baby, I think, and her husband had been killed. He was a fireman and he'd actually been killed in the World Trade Center. So you can imagine her distress, her, you know, her anger, her sadness. Um, but in the middle of that, of course, she said she had this baby who was gurgling and wanted to play and was full of joy Had obviously had no idea what was going on. So she said in several moments, she actually genuinely enjoyed playing with her baby, cuddling her baby. And so examples like that, tragic though they are, people who managed to get a couple of those joyful moments in the middle of all the angst and all the distress actually came out of the whole thing much better you know so so i think just trying to even though um and and you know if, if people are really depressed and really down almost like forcing yourself to go out and do something nice can be really powerful so you know maybe going out for a coffee with a friend even when you don't feel like it you really don't want to do it sometimes forcing yourself to i might find that sometime i'm i'm trying to get back into doing some more regular running for example and sometimes you wake up on a cold morning and you're like oh the last thing i want to do is go out for a run now but actually i know once i force myself to do it i'll really enjoy it and i feel much better when i come back you know so i think simply doing those kind of things you're trying to um, structure your day, make sure you get some positive experiences in there and, and kind of just really accept that, you know, there are going to be bad periods and, and rather than trying to suppress it, almost kind of embrace it and really ask yourself, what can you do to make things better? I mean, they're kind of very basic ways I think we can kind of really help. Uh, Professor, um, Elaine, one, uh, one of the key questions here is, um, you know, your book, Switchcraft, we should just um, switch, is it switch, <coughs> Switchcraft? Craft. Yes. Craft. So switchcraft, like, witch, like witchcraft, but with switch. So it's basically about, it's, it's basically about the art of switching. So so one of the things. You, oh, what, what I kind of how did you choose that name, switchcraft? What was it all about? And where can anyone, um, anyone who's looking to change their mindset, why? What lessons would they learn from buying your book? Just key question. I, I think I think so. I, I think it's the lessons are it's it's packed full of really good tips. I think and um, for how you deal with uncertainty and a very unpredictable world. And and we've really had an unpredictable world recently, as as we know, with the pandemic and with all the, all the other things. But as I said, I actually I actually started the book way before we'd ever heard of coronavirus. So, um, so you know, because actually even before any of that, the world is always uncertain. But, you know, we never quite know. What, when something's going to happen, when a friend gets ill, you know, people die, people leave us, you know, all sorts of things happen to us. And um, so that's really when I started the book. And of course, as I was writing it, we had the coronavirus pandemic and all of that. So it, it became much more relevant. And so I think it is full of, of kind of tips and strategies to try and deal with that kind of uncertainty. And there's three kind of elements to it, I guess. Um, so I'm saying this, so the most important thing is agility. So I'm arguing that, you know, we need to be much more mentally agile and flexible. So people who are more open-minded and more resilient tend to find ways around problems, you know, tend to find, be much more flexible and adaptable. Um, you know, when we get very stressed and anxious, we tend to get quite rigid in our way of thinking um, and we get stuck in one way of doing things or one way of thinking. So switchcraft is the opposite of that. It's about being much more mentally agile, you know, being much more open, but it's not an agility just for the sake of it. It's not just switching for the sake of it. So when I say that agility has to be informed by three things. So one is a deeper level of self-awareness. 
so there's a lot there's a couple of chapters in the book about really looking at yourself you know what are your values really you know really probing into yourself a little bit so there's lots of tests there about looking at maybe your personality tendencies but also on a deeper level looking at your own personal narrative like what's your personal story and there's a nice little exercise in there where you can really uncover your kind of personal story um, and also there's a lot of tips about tuning into your physical body a bit more re really tuning into what your body is telling you so that self-awareness is really important and then situational awareness so having a much deeper understanding of the situation you're in and the broader context because a lot again a lot of us go around in the world very much in, in, almost like we're blind you know we're, we're not really processing what's going on around us we often want the world to be the way we want it to be rather than the way it actually is you know and and we've all had that situation you know where you might have lots of clues that somebody isn't particularly honest for example but you don't want to believe that so actually you keep thinking oh he's fine he's fine he's fine and then finally you realize actually all the clues were there you know um so those kind of things so there's lots of kind of tips and strategies about how you become better at really understanding your situation part of that is is delving into your intuition a little bit um so and, and also then the, the third component is your emotional awareness so really kind of tuning into both the negative and the positive emotions so it's basically it's those kind of components of you know being very agile mentally agile but that agility is formed by being self-aware, aware of the situation and aware of your emotions. Um, and, and those kind of exercises will really help to deal with the much more uncertain world that we're living in. And that's, that's really helpful because I think, you know, today's world, like, we, like you just so rightly said, you didn't write this for the pandemic, but on light of everything that's happened, this is a more need, much needed book, more than ever exactly. at a time like this. I have to ask you a question about you know, we, we have a biased brain. Our brain is very biased. It chooses things in yes. terms of the way we interpret um, interpret things in terms of our attention, our memory. Can these can these lessons, can these behaviors of biases, can they be unlearned? Yes, well, they can, yeah. And, 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 you know, I think one way we can do that is is by these exercises of trying to, you know, reinterpret situations. As we said, you know, thinking back to a situation where you interpret it in one way, trying to think of other ways. Um, a lot of the stuff we do in the in the lab, which is kind of a bit more technical, is kind of what we call attentional training um, paradigms. So it's, they're almost like computer games. So as I mentioned, um, anxious people, for example, tend to selectively notice more negative information. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, and so what we've done is we, we've set up lots of computer training programs where we, um, it's slightly tricky to explain, but we, we have images flash up on a computer screen. So either very positive images, like your know, puppies playing in a field, nice, nice pleasant kind of images, and then much less pleasant images. So things like, snakes and spiders and you know quite gory scenes so we've got all these different images and, and what we do people simply have to find a simple target like say a, a, a red square for example and what we do is we deliberately people don't realize this because everything's going quite quickly but the target is 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 deliberately um, appearing in the same location as the more pleasant images so the idea is that we're training people to pull their attention away from the negative towards the more um, positive because we know that for a non-anxious person doing that task, their attention will be distributed fairly equally around everything. Um, whereas for the more anxious people, they will instantly zone in on the much more negative and they'll get stuck on the negative images. So the idea is that if these targets they have to search for are always in the opposite location, so they're in a different location, that over time we're training people to, to gradually pull their attention away. And I have to say the research is a little bit mixed um, in terms of how successful that is. There's been some studies that show it's very successful. Other studies show it isn't so successful. And I think there's a lot of reasons for that. I think to a large extent, it depends how engaged people are with it. If people really focus on it, then it tends to be quite successful. If people are only half paying attention, it's not so successful. So, so it's not quite there yet in terms of something we can actually offer to the public as kind of a, a real treatment, if you like. Yeah. Um, but, but it's kind of there's a lot of really good research going on at the moment around that. And the similar kind of training programs being tested, which look at inter interpretation. 
So they give, so it, it's kind of, you give little scenarios where there's a very ambiguous outcome, and then you resolve that by say a single word or a single sentence, which either resolves it in a positive way or in a negative way. And again, it's the same kind of logic that for anxious people, we know they will naturally always resolve it in a more negative way. So if the correct answer, if you like, is always given as the more positive one, the idea is you're retraining the brain a little bit. So, so I said, there's lots of exciting research going on in labs all around the world on this. And it's not, as I said, it's not quite there yet in terms of a definitive solution. Um, but, you know, as, as I was saying earlier, I think a lot of the things people can do in everyday life is, is things like, you know, um, look look for the happy face on the train for example if you're on your way into work you know look for the more positive try and look back on things that have upset you and try and reinterpret those in different ways see can you come up with different ways of interpreting it another i can just give another kind of tip another thing which um but i've done some executive coaching this has been quite helpful to people so asking people to keep a diary each day so particularly for people who are quite negative um, if you keep a diary each day and just list out, say at the end of each day, maybe list out kind of five nice things that happened to you and five less nice things that happened to you, like five bad things that happened to you. And these don't have to, have to be really big things. It might be, you know, you went for a nice walk, you, you met a friend unexpectedly, you just had a very quick chat, you had a nice bar of chocolate, just, you know, it, it, it can be just like small everyday things. Whereas the, the unpleasant things could be things like you missed the bus on the way into work or you were late for a meeting, you know, just these everyday type of things. And if you write those down over several weeks, what, what you find is, first of all, that's tuning you in to some of the positive things that happened. And remember, if somebody is very negatively biased, they generally won't really have processed the positive things. So by forcing yourself to think of five nice things that happened, you've actually, you're tuning your brain in a little bit to the more positive things. But what's actually even more powerful is if you go back in, say, about seven weeks' time, if you do this regularly, if you go back to seven weeks' time, and maybe just ask yourself, like, a couple of weeks ago, what happened? And someone who's kind of a bit anxious might say, oh, well, it was really bad. I missed this meeting. And I, this, all these bad things happened. And then when they look at their diary, they see, actually, that all these good things happened as well. So it kind of, it gives you balance. And and I've often been amazed that people who um, I've kind of been uh, kind of dealing with who've been very negatively biased are often genuinely shocked that they've just forgotten some of these nice things that happened. And some of them were quite big things. Like, you know, like one man, for example, hadn't seen his daughter for a long time. And, you know, he, he saw her for a weekend and he had a whole weekend with her. And he literally, about two months later, he just forgotten that. And he said that was such a joyful weekend for him. It was really, he was really happy. Um, and he literally couldn't believe eight weeks later, he'd just more or less forgotten that. So, so I think it, it works on both ways. It tunes you in to the positive on a day-to-day -day basis. But also, if you go back a couple of weeks, you'd often be surprised to find that actually there were lots of good things that happened. So the world isn't quite as bad as you might think. And, and over time, that can really help people to retrain those negative biases. But it's not easy. I mean, that's why I say to people, there's no easy switch. You know, it's um, it's something, it's a bit like training to get physically fit. You, it's, it's like going to the gym. You need to do it regularly and, and really keep, keep at it, really. I, I agree. I agree. I, I love that like you said it's like going to the gym. You know, it's not something that will happen overnight. It's something you just have to do baby steps, and hopefully you get to exactly. that point you want to get to. You know, exactly. I, have, I have to ask you this question because I started it at the beginning when I did the introduction with you. I said, there, "Are there new science-based mental health approach that exists or that are common in terms that can use where people could put a benchmark on what is mental health?" How do I know what level of mental? What is my threshold? How do I? How do, when yeah. do I seek? When do I now seek help? When do I really, really know I now it's gone past? I can't do anything about it. Is there a science-based yeah. approach? Have you, are you, have you done any research with pharmaceuticals, like we have with other illnesses? Is there something now based that we, people could start utilizing and saying this is something yeah. I now think I'm now here. <laughs> right, we do it yeah. when we have when we talk it's, about pain or right? whenever I have any pain, the first thing doctor asks me, on the scale of one to ten, where is your pain? I say, okay, is it eight or nine? Well, yes. What are you doing with mental health? How are we measuring this? It's it's a really, really great question and and a really, really difficult question to answer, to be honest. And of course, that's what a lot of researchers are, are looking at, exactly that. I mean, you've probably come across there's a lot of controversy about kind of um diagnosis 
diagnosis, you know, and, 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 you know, like what is depression, what is anxiety, and what we find is that um, there's such a co-relationship between particularly anxiety and depression, for example, and eating disorders and lots of other issues. And um, there's a lot of psychologists now who argue that actually there's no such thing as these different diagnoses, um, that actually we have general more general dimensions, if you like, of general, say, vulnerability. So general, you, you, the, the easiest thing to call it is probably anxiety related, like worry, anxiety, which also includes elements of depression. So given that, I think it can be quite really, really difficult. And when you look at any of the psychiatric diagnoses, like clinical depression, anxiety, different things, there's so much overlap. You know, it's 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 kind of. I mean, there are ways. You, you, there are ways you can try and separate. And um, there's usually about five or six different things that people have to uh, do to get a diagnosis of depression or anxiety or different things. Um, but the problem is, it's it is very fluid a lot of the time, and people often go from one end to the other. So it, it's a genuinely really difficult kind of thing to to answer. And everyone kind of has their own benchmark. The World Health Organization has a definition of kind of mental health and mental well-being, and they really they simply say mental health is about if you can function well in your society, in your family, in your society, that's kind of being mentally well. So if you can do your day to day tasks and you can function, you know, if, if you start getting to the point where you can't function in that way. So if you're missing work regularly, if you can't look after your children, you know, if those kind of things are happening. Um, and it, it's, I know it's, it's not very helpful, but people often kind of say, you know, you, you know it when you see it, you know, it, it's kind of, even though it's very hard, there's, there's no, it's not like, as you say, with the pain scale, you say it's eight or nine, and most of us have a kind of sense of that. It, it's, it's kind of not like that, but most of us ourselves would know when we're really getting to a point where we're, we're, we're not functioning very well, you know, so there is that kind of spectrum. And um, I do think now, Nowadays, we do tend to medicalize mental health um, far too much, actually. I think we kind of sometimes we think like the normal kind of stresses and strains of everyday life. Often we think, oh, that's that's mental ill health, whereas actually it isn't. It is on a different level. Um, so I think it, it's again, I know I'm not being very clear, but there, it is actually it's I think because the human brain is just so complicated and mental health and well-being is so complicated, it is really difficult. There isn't a, a single point where you say, this person but i think as i said generally most of us kind of know when somebody really isn't functioning and and including ourselves we know when we're really not functioning and that's when i think we need to seek help um and you know i think that's where a lot of things um like the kind of self-help books and other things can really be helpful in in dealing with the everyday kind of stresses but there does come a point where people do need professional help they need to go and really get more guidance in terms of you know how how, how things are going um and i think you know those kind of signs if people are stopping self-care for example you know they're they're kind of not coming out of the house they're just not functioning they're real red signals you know and also people would say um one of the things that happened in the pandemic and it came up we did another study an online study during the lockdowns in the uk for example with again with teenagers and it was very distressing one of the things we really found was that a lot of people who had had eating problems, eating disorder problems, were really triggered in the lockdown. So we, people really started, you know, not eating or eating too much, you know, binge eating. Um, and it, it's interesting that people, if you've had eating disorder problems, people are really well aware of, of, of what's kind of happening. So they can know themselves, even though they can't stop themselves, they kind of do know. So I think for parents and for other people, just keeping an eye out that, you know, if, if, if you know, people have had those kind of problems, um, you know, you need to really keep a, a close eye on that. And and one of the things we found was that, generally speaking, actually, most teenagers were quite resilient in the lockdown. They kind of, they really dealt with quite well. But people who had had previous mental health problems really suffered. They were the ones, everything was really triggered again. So whereas people who hadn't had mental health problems in the past, initially, they obviously were very stressed and they, but, but actually, what a lot of research shows is that we're all much more resilient than we think we are. And I think that's, again, something we tend to forget that a lot of research shows that now that actually about, I think it's about 65 to 75% of people come through adversity really well, really in a resilient way. About 10%, 10 to 15 um, do develop problems like PTSD or severe anxiety problems. Um, but another 10% 
actually get better after the adversity. So that's called post-traumatic growth. So people actually grow from the adversity. And this is often the case with um, personal illness, like cancer, for example, people who get cancer or different things happen, they often say in many ways, kind of the best thing that ever happened to me because I really reevaluated my life. I really, and they, they actually say they've genuinely grown as people um, having come through that adversity. So it's really interesting that if you think about it, the majority of people come through in a very resilient way, 10%, actually get better in many ways they kind of have post-traumatic growth and about 10 to 50 percent do develop um, serious problems so i think we kind of forget that as well i think we we tend to think there's going to be a big epidemic of mental health problems but actually over time all the research shows that actually we're much more resilient than we think and if you think about it that makes sense i don't think any of us would be here if our ancestors hadn't been very resilient because our ancestors had to deal with huge problems you know um, all through evolution really so you know, the very fact we're here, I think, shows we're pretty agile and we're pretty resilient. <laughs> My final question to you is that, you know, I always like to know your own personal experiences um, in your own personal <laughs> approach to your mental health. You know, you do a lot of talk, you give, you've written, you're an author, you've written numerous books about this issue. What can a person do or what do you normally do to better your own mental health? I think for me, it's definitely trying to control my workload. <laughs> that's, that's one thing, because um, I think it's, I think all of us, you know, I mean, I think all of us have, a lot of us have kind of jobs where you've got multiple projects going on at any given moment. Um, and I'm actually the head of a school now, quite a big school of psychology here in, in Adelaide. Um, and you can imagine there's so many different things going on. And it's the kind of job that you could just work 24 hours a day and you still wouldn't be finished, you know. So, so I think, um, and I think a number of years ago, I wasn't very good at that. I would tend to kind of work far too much, I would work long hours, I would I'd have long lists of things that I would try and do, and, and I would just get myself very stressed, really. Um, so what I do now is I generally, and, and one of the things I recommend in Switchcraft, actually, is a useful thing to do, is to come up with maybe three or four projects in each day that are sensible, like sensible time in terms of time frame. So come up with th maybe three things you think you can do in a day and you should do in that day. And so rather than having this big list of 20 items and just work your way through it, just say, okay, today I'm gonna to work on these three, you know, and tomorrow you can work another three. Um, and just the, the more you kind of do that, the more you learn like what, what might be a sensible thing. So if, if like one task might take the whole day, for example. So in that case, you should just put one thing down. Um, and for me, that's really important because you know I, I have such a variety of things so there's a lot of meetings I have to go to I've got some teaching I do some research and um, I kind of do podcasts like this I do different kind of things um, and you know there's just so many things and if you try and if you try and squeeze everything in without any limits I think you very quickly get stressed um, and again in switchcraft one thing I, I kind of say is that you know the research tells us that multitasking is a real myth you know we often think we we can multi multitask very well actually what's happening in multitasking is we are switching very rapidly between one thing and the other. We're not actually doing multiple things at the same time. We're actually switching very rapidly. And that's very draining. There's a lot of research um, that I've been doing, for example, and other people have been doing, showing that when you switch from one mental set to another or one mental task to another, that drains the battery a little bit. It drains your mental battery. And so one thing we know is that it's really important to take a break between different tasks. So even if it's only a few minutes, if you were say, if I'm say, for example, writing a paper and I say, okay, I'm going to give myself a couple of hours to finish this paper and get it done. And then I'm going to move on. I'm going to prepare a lecture. And um, it's really important to, at the end of one task, no matter how you might've run over time a little bit, rather than jumping straight onto the next one, just stand up, walk around, maybe go out for a cup of coffee, maybe have a little walk outside if possible. It could only be five or 10 minutes, but that gap, that break is really, really important. Um, and that will really help you recharge your batteries a little bit and get on with things. So I do try and I try and practice that myself. So limiting my tasks for the day and also making sure I take a break between tasks. And um, so I, I'm not draining myself too much. Professor, where do we get your book Switchcraft? We're based out in London and people around the world who really are dying to get a couple of your book. Where could they get it? Well, it's, it's, it's available now in all bookshops. It came out in the UK and in, the, uh, in, um, in May. It's coming out in the US in September. So it's not out in the US yet, but it's on Amazon. And as I said, it should be available in all the, all the good bookshops. 
Oh, wonderful. Thank you so much. I really appreciate your time. I, I mean, we've learned so much about our mental health. It's a massive problem today. Any final words before I let you go? Well, no, I just think one of the ways I've ended um, Switchcraft, actually, is I've just really said to people, you know, try and um, live your life as a joy rather than as a chore, because I think a lot of the time we do get, we get kind of beaten down by all of the problems, and there are problems, but I think actually there's a lot of really joyful things in the world as well, there's a lot of really good things, so I think even though it can sound trivial, I think actually try and look for the positive stuff out there and try and enjoy your life as, as, as best you can. I think I love the way you added this because it's, it is so true. If you when we look at the media, we look at everywhere else, they're so really negative. But I think there was so much joy in the world that it's just it's so it's so beautiful. People don't even want to write about it because it's just too much. And I thank you for this. Exactly. Thank you. Exactly. So thank you. Good. Well, it's lovely joining you, and thanks for having me on. Absolutely. Thank you.